Neuromancer by William Gibson. So this is episode 43 of a series I'm doing called The Masterpieces of Science Fiction. And I'm going to structure this review a little bit different. I'm going to go over some intro stuff. And then this is a book that I DNF'd twice, and the third time was a charm. I fi it finally clicked with me, so I'm going to go over some things that helped me to get a fulfilling read out of this finally, and maybe some ways that it could help you if, if you want to try this or if you've been challenged by this book before. And then I'm going to briefly talk about the plot and then kind of wrap up the video and talk about the sequels a little bit and if, I, if I'm going to go on with those and, and read those as well. So this book was copyright 1984 and I have this ace paperback. It is an older edition but I'm going to post a link to a video from another fellow booktuber Richard at Vintage SF. He did a video a while back where he found a copy of the original paperback and that it's the the paperback cover that I used in my thumbnail and that was actually the first official release of this book. It went straight to paperback as an Ace Science Fiction Special Series 3. And Richard has a great video where he found it in the wild, and it's a beautiful, pristine copy of the book. It's in really good shape. It's probably worth a lot of money. And he's really excited about it, and I'm sure if I ever find that book in the wild, I'll probably be even more excited. So I'll post that link down in the description. And, you know, this book is... Everyone knows about this book. This book won the Hugo, the Nebula, and the Philip K. Dick Award all in the same year. I don't think any other book did that. It kind of kind of broke out past the science fiction reading community. This is a mainstream book. Most people have heard about it or tried to read it or have read it. It, it did a bunch of new things that I think people didn't really think like they thought everything had been played out at that point in the in the genre but here William Gibson comes along with his first novel by the way and just completely comes up with like a whole new subgenre with new terminology he envisioned things that turned out to be fairly true and it's just it's an amazing book and it has this huge cultural impact and significance that goes along with it now, I also have this trade paperback, and if you're going into bookstores these days, this is probably something that you're going to see, something more along these lines. And this is the edition I actually read, and what this has that the other one, that this one didn't, was this had an afterwards by Jack Womack that I thought was pretty interesting. He goes over quite a few things, but one interesting thing I just want to bring up is he kind of asks a question when you get a very influential, important piece of work like this, is the is it that the author is predicting the future or did the author actually influence the future? So it was really interesting to think about that after finishing the book. And, and like I said, it, it wasn't in, in this copy. So if you get a chance to, to read that afterwards, it, I thought it was pretty good. Okay, so... I guess with all that out of the way, let's go into some of the challenges with this book. Like I said, I tried to read this twice before, felt like I was getting lost, and ended up DNFing it multiple times. And then, so I got some advice from some other readers and, and commenters. One commenter on this channel recommended reading Burning Chrome first. And what Burning Chrome is, is it's a collection of 10 short stories and three of these short stories actually take place in the Sprawl universe, which is where Neuromancers kind of takes place. So you get some settings, some characters, and some of the terminology. You, all the stories you get exposed to William Gibson's writing style. So it's a really good way to kind of prep yourself, and, and it really worked for me. But the three stories that are linked into the Sprawl universe are Johnny Mnemonic, which is got turned into a movie. I can't remember if it was good or not. You also have The New Rose Hotel and Burning Chrome. Now, Johnny Mnemonic, 
that introduced one of the main characters in this book named Molly. And she's doing her thing in, in that book and it's in the short story. It's, it's a really good short story. It's probably my favorite short story in this collection. And it ends and it's a neat story. But if you read Neuromancer, you get to kind of find out what happens after that. She kind of at one point reminisces and tells a story and it, it kind of wraps up that. And when I got to that point in Neuromancer, it was really cool to tie it back into this. Now, the other thing I did was I'd read one of these short stories and then on the Wikipedia page for this book, Burning Chrome, it lists all the 10 short stories and there's a hyperlink that takes you to a page dedicated to each one of these stories. So I'd read the story in here and then I'd go to Wikipedia and read the plot synopsis and kind of compare how much I got out of it, if I got all the plot or if I missed something. And generally I did pretty good. I kind of built myself up and towards the end I was getting pretty good at deciphering what William Gibson's talking about. So that might be something that's useful. Also there's just a fandom page for I think the whole Sprawl universe. So if you just Google Neuromancer Sim Stim, because that's a term he uses in here, like what is a Sim Stim? And you can just read and try to gather what it is through the context of the book. He'll never really explain some of these terms. But I, I went and Googled some of these terms and it quickly describes what that is. I didn't read further because I was afraid of maybe getting to some spoilers. I think they talk about how it was used in certain books or whatever, but you can Google some terms and get some things defined for you and it does make it a little bit easier. And so the, the biggest challenge of this book is really, in my opinion, William Gibson's prose. And in my thumbnail, I called it a neon prose. And, and I Googled that later, and I don't think anyone's used that term. Maybe I coined a new term. But I think a lot of people are familiar with the term a purple prose, and that's used in like poetry and literature and fantasy and it's just this overly ornate flowery descriptive um, language that's used that's kind of over the top and when I say neon prose think if if you're in this like dark long alleyway and there's some neon lights and some it is kind of raining and the lights are, the neon lights are buzzing and the rain is kind of dripping onto the lights and they're kind of flickering in and off and sparking. And you're looking down the alleyway and you can't really see exactly what's going on. And you're not sure if you're just, you just can't see it or if maybe it is virtual reality that you're in, or maybe you're just really high on drugs. So that's kind of the feeling that I got through a lot of this book. And that's part of the challenge of reading this book is being set in that, dealing with that prose, not really knowing the terms and all of that. So another link that I'm gonna put in the description is another fellow booktuber, The Book Rapport. And he did a video um, breaking down Neuromancer and its sequel, uh, count zero and it's a really good video, but I'm gonna put a timestamp that takes you to a certain part in the video that was really cool um, Go back and watch the whole video. It's really great But if if you want to watch at least anything of this uh, Definitely check this out whether you read Neuromancer or not I think you would find get some enjoyment out of this because what he did was he went to chat GPT and he asked ChatGPT to write a description of going to a grocery store in the style of William Gibson. And what ChatGPT pumped out was just awesome. And it gives you a taste of what you're in store for if you decide to tackle this. So with all of that out of the way, you know, I felt like I was prepped. I started reading the book. Now we're going to get into the plot a little bit, just very briefly. So in the beginning of the book, you're, you're kind of introduced to the main character, Chase, and he's in Japan. And you find out that he is a hacker and he jacks into the Matrix and 
it's this virtual reality kind of thing, you know, and he had been working for some people and he decided to try to pull one off on them and kind of steal something from them. And they found out and instead of killing him, they rendered his body useless to be able to plug into the matrix again. So basically, one of his main talents, everything his whole life and everything, the way he could make money was taken from him. So we find him in Japan where he's kind of down on his luck. He's almost suicidal. And he meets a bunch of characters there. He meets Molly, the, the girl that was in the first story, um, Johnny Mnemonic. And they kind of become friends. And, you know, he's also approached by this kind of mysterious guy who says, hey, I can fix you to where you can jack back into the Matrix. Um, but there's a caveat, you know, I'm going to put some little poison um, things inside of your body in case you don't do what we're told. And, and then if you, you know, do this and help us with this heist, then we'll kind of remove all that. You can go back to being who you were before. So Chase, he, like you said, he was down on his luck and he decides to, um, you know, accept this. And it kind of sets up this whole heist, which is the majority of this book is kind of like a heist story. Now, in the beginning of this, when you're reading about Chase in Japan, it was really easy for me to understand. And I instantly clicked with it. And I'm thinking, yes, I got this. I All that work kind of paid off. I understand everything that's going on. But then when he gets back to the sprawl, which is the whole East Coast of the United States is kind of turned into one big metropolis. And that's where the majority of the, the story takes place, or some of it. There's space. It kind of goes all over the place. But this universe and a lot of the key moments and everything take place on the East Coast of the United States. And this is kind of where, we, where he gets to be able to jack back into the Matrix. And... Once he starts doing that, the confusion sets back in. I think you could read this book probably three or four times and still not fully understand everything that's going on when he's when he's jacking into the Matrix because that's where he does his hacking. And when he's in there, he runs across AIs. He runs across digital constructs of real people, digital constructs of dead people. And William Gibson doesn't really tell you in the beginning of a chapter or a scene whether Chase is in the real world or if he's in the Matrix or anything like that. So it's challenging no matter how much work you try to prep yourself for. I think it's still going to be a challenging read. And that's really all I'm going to talk about for the the plot. You know, I know this book is, is a lot about the mood and the setting and the language the terms, all of that, but I really did enjoy the plot too. I I thought it was great the way it was set up. We got good motivations for the characters. There was a lot of mysterious aspects to who some of these people are working for. So it kept you reading along, trying to figure out who was who. And and then it was tied up pretty good at the end. I like there was a couple twists and some things that um going to feed into the next part of this video of do I want to read further into the the Sprawl trilogy. So there were some things at the end that really pushed me into definitely wanting to read the next two books, Count Zero and Mona Lisa Overdrive. Now I don't know if I'm going to jump into these anytime soon. This is one of those books I think you have to be in the right mood, be ready for a challenge. From what I can tell, these two sequels aren't quite as challenging as Neuromancer is. Um, so we'll just have to see. If I kind of get the motivation soon, I'll probably just jump right into Count Zero, which is the next book. If I wait too long, I might reread Neuromancer once again to try to just peel back a couple more layers of that story and then maybe continue on with these. So that's where we're at there. Um, glad I kind of not only checked it off the list, but actually enjoyed the book. This is, I think, a four-star read for me. I don't think I could give it a five just because I don't like being 
uncomfortable or not knowing what's going on to a T. And 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 the, while everything was unique in in what William Gibson built here, these these kind of books maybe aren't just my favorite in general, but. I understand why people would just fall in love with this kind of writing style and probably read everything that William Gibson read and all the other cyberpunk books that kind of came out after that. So that's where we're at there. Um, I got a little bit of time. That was pretty much everything I wanted to read in this month. And so I might try to read A Choice of Gods by Clifford Simic, or I might just jump into... Um, another longer book for next month and kind of get a head start on it. So I'm not quite sure where I'm there at there yet, but just look for the next video and, uh, and you'll find out. So thanks for watching. And once again, see you in the next video.